My name is Will Jimeno. I'm a retired Port Authority Police Detective with the Port Authority Police of New York and New Jersey. Well, on September 11th, I remember our radios crackling about 8.45. Inspector Fields said, we're going to go down to the World Trade Center, which is owned and operated by the Port Authority, and we had Port Authority police officers there because we have a command there. Uh, we're going to help them in the evacuation. And I remember looking up into that big black gaping hole, and I saw people. People were jumping by themselves, holding hands. And out of that devastation, here comes Sergeant McLaughlin running toward us. And he said, I need volunteers. Uh, Sergeant McLaughlin said, let's go, we're going to Tower 2. And that's when we heard a humongous boom. So I turned around from where we came, and I was looking now back into the lobby of 2, when I saw a fireball, I mean, the size of my house. And everything starts just like an earthquake, rocking and rolling. And I grabbed my helmet, and I didn't know what to do. I look up into the ceiling, everything's shaking and concrete's just coming down. And I'm yelling 813, 813, which is our code for Port Authority Police, that everybody come, we're in trouble. All I could do was cover them up and hold on for dear life. And it seemed like it was happening forever, and then everything stopped and we were in the dark. It was really dusty, and it took a while. And once I could see, I saw we were literally in a small void or cavern. And then I realized I'm trapped, I can't move, and I look, and from my left armpit down, there was like a slab of concrete that just went all the way down my left side. My right uh, leg was up in a, a 45 degree angle and I couldn't move. Uh, all I had was use of my right arm, part of my left arm, and uh, the only thing exposed was my initial handcuffs and my sidearm. Everything else was buried. And at that moment, Sergeant McLaughlin was actually trapped in the fetal position on the initial collapse. He wasn't injured. He was just trapped. Um, being the good leader, he said, sound off. So I said, Jimeno, Dominic said, Pizzullo. And that's when we didn't hear Antonio Rodriguez or Christopher Amoroso. And that was very difficult for us to realize that we just lost two fellow police officers, two fellow Americans, two fathers, two sons. And it got real, like, okay, this, they're gone. And at that point, Sergeant Glock said, what's everybody's condition? Dominic said, I'm, I'm, I'm compacted, but I'm okay. At that point, I had to tell Sergeant McLaughlin, I'm in a lot of pain, I have concrete on me. And that's when I guess the shock started wearing off and the pain started you know, coming toward me. And uh, the only way I can equate it to was like 100 Chevy Suburbans on my left side. I was just being crushed. And that's when we heard another boom. And it was just like the first one. I saw Dominic and Dominic now is only Things had shifted. He was only a couple feet from me, and uh, and he said, Willie, I'm dying. I said, hold on, Dom. And he said, I'm dying, bro. And uh, he actually cracked a joke and asked Sergeant McLaughlin for a 3-8, which is our code for a break. Sergeant McLaughlin actually stopped yelling and said, yeah, you can have a 3-8. At that point, Dominic pulled out his sidearm and fired one round into that hole above us as a last-ditch effort to let somebody know we were down there. And he slumped over and and I had to watch my friend die, and that was difficult. Uh, as the night progressed, it got to a point that evening that I just wanted to give up. And I always tell people, I don't consider it my story, I think it's just a human story, but at one point, I just wanted to die. We had already lost three men, uh, been crushed, i have been burnt, Sergeant McLaughlin's in a lot of pain. I didn't think there was any chance we were gonna make it out. And I realized that at that moment, if I continue to fight, and I die on my own terms, the cowards, the terrorists, they don't win. I go out the way I wanted to do. And at that point, I told Sergeant McLaughlin with some colorful words, we're gonna make it out of this hellhole. And we continued to fight till about eight o'clock that night when I heard in the distance, and I thought I was hallucinating, I heard United States Marine Corps, can anybody hear us? And it was coming from my right side. Uh, I started yelling, PAPD officers down. They kept getting closer, getting closer. It was like a dream. They started working on me, and uh, it, my operation took three hours. There was a lot of pain. Um, uh, there was a lot of laughter down there, believe it or not. We would laugh. Uh, and these guys just kept working. Scott would make his way to me, uh, and then Chuck Sharika, who was a paramedic, a civilian, who just joined up some, came out of nowhere to uh, give me, render me aid, uh, would work on me a little bit. And they were just like groundhogs. They kept digging, digging. Uh, many times during that three hours, they were ordered to leave us. They said, uh, they were ordered, you've got to leave because it's so dangerous. We had an encroaching fire above us. They said, we're not leaving these guys. And I, I just remember thinking to myself, this is what Americans are. These are what good human beings are. 
I mean, what I saw those men do from my angle that I could see, because again, I could only see two bald heads, but their pain from coughing and the heat and the conditions were just so horrific, but they never gave up on us, you know? And I remember, um, you know, Scott saying when he was working a, a machine tool to try to get me out when the concrete, he needed to crack it, he goes, we're here with you. And uh, if this collapses on all of us, there's hundreds of people out there that know where we are. And I just thought to myself, how brave is that? And uh, I was buried for 13 hours and uh, they took me into the ER where I was told I flatlined twice that night. Uh, when I woke up the next day, I had a tube down my throat. There was literally rocks coming out of my, my lungs. Um, it was a long, long road to recovery. I mean, um, spent a lot of time in ICU, had like 13 surgeries, um, but I was alive. The one thing that gave me hope after I got out of Bellevue Hospital and was at Kessler uh, Rehabilitation Center in West Orange was that they told me if I worked hard and I could get myself in a wheelchair, I could be there for the birth of my daughter, Olivia. And I was, I worked really hard. And on November 26, 2001, my birthday, my little girl, Olivia, was born. And that was my birthday gift. You know, I think it's, it's just an awesome thing to have 9-11 uh, as a National Day of Service because we need that. We need to be able to remember uh, those we lost that day, but more importantly, teach these future generations that don't even have a concept of what happened 9-11. Many people, I, when I go do speaking engagements, they weren't even born. Uh, so it's important that we instill in them what happened that day, but more importantly, how we came together that day and how to make uh, the world a better place by participating and helping each other, helping your community, helping your, your, your fellow human being. And we have to do the best we can each and every single day as human beings to make this a better world. And just like on September 11th, when I was standing in front of those towers and I felt so small, that's what's gonna happen if we don't help each other. We're just small. But when we come together, like Patty, Scott, Chuck did, to get me out and then the rest of the other rescue workers to get John out, that's our strength. So as we as human beings, when we can come together and, and work together, we're unstoppable.